everybody. Glad to see everybody here. It looks like we got a good crowd. Um, today we're talking about paint. So uh, I've got a bunch of uh, slides to show you. Uh, I brought a lot of show and tell. I've got, I've got uh, minerals. I've got binders. Uh, I've got slips. I've got pots. So um, hopefully we got a lot to talk about. And if you all have questions, just go ahead and drop those in the chat anytime and I'll answer them as they come in. I'll talk a little bit. I'll get back, you know, try to catch up on the questions and go back to my presentation. And so um, just drop those in whenever and I'll get those done. Uh, let's see. Message held for review. What in the world, Pap? Oh, I see. I don't know why they didn't like that, Pap. I proved it. Um, I've got a couple of reminders for everybody and I'm going to try to do them uh, early and then again late. Uh, okay. Uh, so first of all, if you could hit the like button, that helps me out with the algorithm quite a bit. So if you could just hit that, that'd be good. If you're not subscribed, think about subscribing because uh, I do a live stream every month and then uh, I do weekly videos on Wednesday and sometimes I have uh, in-between videos as well. For example, I have one coming out on Sunday as well this week. So um, all, you know, primitive pottery related, Southwestern specifically is what I work on, but um, I answer questions sometimes related to all things uh, primitive pottery. Uh, so the reminders I had for you all today were uh, the Southwest Kiln Conference is coming up. That's the first weekend in October, I think. Something like, might be the second. Anyway, it's like 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th, something like that. It's in Silver City, New Mexico. So if, um, if you're in the area, if you're able to travel to Silver City, I wanted to encourage you all to try to attend uh, the Southwest Kiln Conference. Because if you're wanting to learn about primitive pottery, there is no better place. Uh, it is a free conference. Uh, there's going to be lectures and presentations on Friday. There's going to be all kinds of outdoor pottery firings on Saturday. Uh, on Sunday, they're going to open the kiln. A lot of times on Sunday, there's a field trip to collect clay, things like that. So even, even all those things aside, just the opportunity to meet uh, replicators and, and primitive potters and talk and ask questions and stuff. Uh, I'm going to be there, but a lot of other people are going to be there as, as well. Other very smart, very accomplished uh, potters. So... Uh, Remember that uh, if you can, that would be a great opportunity for you. Um, and that is, like I said, first part of October in Silver City, New Mexico. Uh, the website is swkiln.com. There is a link in the doobly-doo. Okay. Um, I'm starting a Slack, uh, what is it, a community? So I have, I have Slack community that I'm building, and that's for, that's for channel members. So um, if, you, if, you, if you become a channel member... Um, then I will I'll, uh, bring you, I'll send you an invite to the, um, uh, the Slack. And, and we talk about pottery in depth there. So if you have questions and stuff, uh, I'm always on. We can answer questions. And it's a lot of uh, very engaged uh, students of primitive pottery there in, on Slack. So uh, that would be a good opportunity. Also, if you're wanting to learn, uh, become a channel member, get an invite to our Slack. Is it a Slack channel? Slack community? Um, and that's, it's sort of like Discord. It's someplace where we can... Uh, communicate a little more privately um, so that was the other thing and then the last thing I wanted to remind you about was um, uh, John Olson uh, I did a video last summer last June about John Olson and his uh, corrugated pottery and I've I've touched on him a few other times in videos if you've watched my content uh, and John is John has been doing uh, replication pottery since the 70s so he's probably you know the grandfather of all Southwest pottery replicators and he specifically is an expert in corrugated pottery uh, and he's been a very fine teacher and mentor to many people. He, uh, he, he, he gives freely of his knowledge, uh, which is something special. Uh, John is suffering from um, cancer. And uh, so he's, he's going through, I don't know, chemo and, and different things, radiation right now. And so there's a GoFundMe for John um, to raise money for his medical expenses. And there's a link to that down in the doobly-doo too. So if you can, uh, think about those things. And, um, and see if you can help John. And if you want to learn, there's a couple opportunities through uh, Slack and uh, the Southwest Kiln Conference. Uh, and I'll go back and I'll answer your questions. And then I'll get into my presentation. Like I said, I have a lot of materials here to go through. So uh, it should be interesting, educational to everybody. All right, where was I at on the question? Stand by while I do this. Uh, Pap, uh, you had a question about um, uh, a workshop. I have a, I have a workshop coming up Labor Day weekend at Q Ranch, but it's full, okay? I have another workshop in the end of October that's here in Tucson. So if you live in Tucson, Pap, uh, this might, the one in Tucson might be uh, better for you. 
Uh, it's at Fort Lowell Park in Tucson. And there is still some openings in that one. Those are the only workshops I have scheduled so far this year. If the one in October fills up, I will schedule another workshop this year. Um, so that's on my website, ancientpottery.how, if you want information on those workshops. Uh, okay, let me try to catch up on the questions here. A lot of hellos. I'm going to skip through those really quick and just say hello to everybody. Uh, I appreciate all of you, but I can't, I can't individually say hi to everybody right now. Uh, on your website, you have to remove more sand from my clay. Okay, somebody worked, pulled some sand out of their clay. That's good. Uh, hello, do you have any advice for finding white kale and slip in the wild? I prefer not to buy it if possible. I live in British Columbia. Uh, white, white clay can be some of the hardest to find in the wild. Um, you know, it just, most clay is, you know, brown or, or gray or something like that. So, um, I really don't. Um, I, in my area, I use Google Earth a lot or, or like Google satellite images on Google Maps, you know, and and look for those colors. So if I'm looking for white, I'll look for areas where there's white and then I'll hike out and, and explore and see if that white is clay. You know, in British Columbia, I know that's not possible because the ground is all covered with vegetation. So um, I don't, you know, you can use uh, soil, soil maps. Like, I don't know about Canada, they probably have the same, but in the United States, um, uh, the US Department of Agriculture or Geological Survey or one of those, they publish uh, soil uh, information for every place in the country. And you can find clay soils, but they often don't mention the color. So um, that may be helpful in finding clay, not white clay. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I wish I had a better answer for you. Sometimes it just requires a lot of on the ground footwork. When I was looking for the white clay to make a lot of polychromes, I, it literally took me, you know, something like 30 years to find it. So good luck with that. Um, Paul Vosper, hello, do you have any advice for, oh, that's the same one, sorry. Um, Pottery grade clay does not exist in, what, Central California? Um, yeah, I, there's probably clay there, um, you know, Zane. Probably not in the Sierras, but I bet down in the, you know, the San Joaquin, that's the valley below you, right, San Joaquin? Uh, I bet there's clay down there. Um, Chris in Kansas, howdy. Uh, hello, Mr. Ward. Uh, why, BJ says, why does my manganese turn brown when it's fire? That's a good question, and I'm going to get to that. Uh, I'm gonna. I have a bunch of topics to cover, and one of those is oxidized black paint. And I will talk about brown manganese paint when I get there. That is on the list. Um, uh, Stephen has the same issue. How do you improve the pottery shape? I can't make it symmetrical. Um, yeah, that's that's just kind of um, that's just kind of practice. But you know, that might be something I could cover in a video at some point because somebody asked that. Uh, not long ago also so uh, that might that may be a whole video subject certainly not something I can answer really quickly uh, but you know a lot of turning while you work and, and scraping but w maybe I'll cover that in a future video that's a good idea um Ren Pixie says I'm working on pookies with red clay sourced outside St. John's temper is one-third starting to develop small cracks towards center drying too fast or too much temper no a uh, drying cracks drying cracks are not from too much temper Drying cracks uh, indicate that your clay has a high shrinkage. Now, a lot of that clay up there around St. John's and, and Concho and where you live, a lot of that clay is is, uh, is bentonite. And that bentonite clay has crazy high shrinkage. So uh, be careful. Um, a lot of that clay might be good for slips, but it's not so good for, um, uh, for building out of because it has such a high shrinkage rate. And if you're using a third temper... Um, those, you should not be getting drying cracks. So I would say probably there's something that's not the best clay to build with, unless you have previous experience with it. That's what it sounds like to me. Um, uh, USGS says just one asbestos. That's right. USGS has all those uh, soil maps. And so I was suggesting, since you're in British Columbia, that uh, the Canadian government probably has something similar. It's a good way to find clay. It's not so good for specific colors if I'm looking for red or white because uh, a lot of times it doesn't go into that. It's just clay, sand, you know, loam, it breaks down the soil into type. Um, hi, Andy. Uh, NB says, I work at a granite shop. So I was wondering if you might have insight on using that really fine granite dust for temper. Yeah, I think that granite dust would probably make good temper. Uh, where I used to live in Sierra Vista, uh, and there's somebody here, Pam, I think, from Tombstone. So uh, listen up, Pam. Uh, I used to get uh, granite. There's In the Huachuca Mountains, there's some very, very soft granite. In fact, it's so soft, it's easier to grind than clay. I put it right in my corn grinder, grind it up, and it comes out like, like sugar fine, sugar powder kind of, you know, and uh, it's really good. Uh, and so I've used granite before for tempering, and it, it does make a good tempering. So I would think that 
granite dust might work good. Try it out. Um, a Dawn, many thanks for all your videos. I've spent this week harvesting clay in East Texas, hoping to pit fire a few things once our burn ban is over. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, that's great. I'm glad you're making progress. I just They just lifted our burn ban uh, a week ago. So I fired yes, yesterday morning for the first time. Well, the first time here in Arizona. I fired New Mexico last weekend. But, um, there's red clays in Central Sierras, more in the foothills area. So that's some good tips for you. Uh, Clarice has some uh, some tips of where clay is, Zane, in the Sierras. So that's helpful. Um, natural glazes, too, uh, for functionality. Um, Lead-based glaze. So um, not so practical for anything you're going to eat out of. That's the only glaze I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I don't glaze. Um, I fire at a very low temperature where silica-based glazes won't melt, but lead-based glazes will. Uh, okay. Maximum shrinkage you would do with... Oh, yeah, Stephen, um, I don't... 15%? Uh, if you get anywhere close to 20%, it's it's going to be hard to keep the pot together. Not to mention, you know, your pot is, is... Literally, you make it this big and it comes out this big. It's very frustrating to see your work shrink. Okay, let me get to the um, let me get to the presentation. So the first item I'm going to talk about is uh, is slips. And so I'll first I'll show you a couple of um, I'll show you a couple of pictures of prehistoric pots that use uh, this material, and then I'll go into kind of the technology of using it. So uh, these are just slips are just clay, just clays li mixed up to a liquid and painted on. So like a lot of times your building clay is brown or gray, and a slip is labeled gives you the ability to add some color to that. So in this case, there is a red and a white slip on this pot, and then the black paint is painted over the top of that slip. All right, uh, I'll show you another one. So here's another example. The first one was tonopolychrome. polychrome. This is four mile polychrome. And the white, the, the clay this is built out of is a gray clay. And then the white area is slipped, and the red area is slipped with a, actually a yellow slip. And they're all polished and then painted over the top of. So these are the kind of things you can do with slip if you can find those you know, those colorful clays like that. So um, here's an example. This is where I collect, uh, I collect both yellow slip and white slip in this area up in um, northern Arizona, up on the Mogollon Rim. And, and sometimes these colored clays, so this is a white clay I'm digging right there. Uh, the vein is literally like three inches, you know, thick. No more than four. It's, it's quite narrow. And so I'm in there, you know, with my rock hammer just picking out little bits at a time. And so if I'm trying to fill a gallon-sized bucket, I may be there an hour just trying to pick it out and, and kind of pick up the little bits and put them in there and, and not pick up the other colors that are obviously falling down. You can see all around my hammer, there's gray and brown and yellow and stuff that you don't want in your white slip, right? So uh, a lot of times those colored slips, um, not only are they not good building clays, but sometimes they're rarer. So like you wouldn't want to build a pot out of this because in order to get enough to build a couple of pots, you know, it takes a lot of work. So by using it as a slip, I'm able to use that little thin vein uh, for a lot of pots. And uh, and here's some red. This is that. Uh, this is up by St. John's um, uh, Ren Pixie. So this is this one's up uh, Witchwell Road. Do you know that area? Uh, and this is a red that holds organic paint. So you know when you get those slips, you find them. Then you got to experiment with them and see how they do. So. Uh, I might try it on a pot, see how it does, if it has too high of a shrinkage or something, or what color it fires, because it doesn't always fire what you think it will. So when I was up in Blanding, uh, I collected some really beautiful green clay, uh, kind of a kind of an army green, olive drab color, um, and I painted it on, and it fired kind of a yellowy orange color. So you have to do some firing experiments. And in this case, I tried it with organic paint and with mineral paint, because the organic paint requires special kinds of clay for it to make black designs on, and, and it works. This is the red clay that, that works with it. So, um, you know, you, you got to get out there. First of all, if you're trying to find natural clay. Now, if you want to buy materials from, you know, from the store, that, and that's all fine too, right? You can go to probably your local ceramic store and say, you know, do you have something that, you know, a clay that's like a nice red color or a nice white color? You can bring home. It doesn't take very much, right? Maybe you know a potter. They can just give you a handful of it. Um, you can slip a lot of pots with it. Um, but this is, you know, this is me going out in the field and trying to find it, like the, the guy in British Columbia. Uh, so it takes a lot of footwork sometimes trying to find those colored slips that you're looking for. Uh, a lot of driving back roads and hiking up mountains and stuff, you know. To me, it's fun. To me, the hunt is, is almost more fun than, than making the pots, just hunting the clay. It's a lot of fun. I haven't been out much this year because the price of gas, uh, you know, it's just so expensive to go places. But um, 
hopefully uh, this fall uh, I'll have some time and some uh, resources, you know, to go out there and, and explore and find some more stuff. Uh, my truck's also broken, so my truck has uh, some transmission problems. So uh, my wife and I are getting by with one vehicle right now, which also means, you know, I can't go on long explorations in the country and she might need the car for something she does. So, uh, uh, so uh, let me show you, this is, this has to do with the reduced paint. Uh, let me show you a couple examples of, of slip pots that I did. So this is, um, uh, let me go back here. This is one I did, oh, I don't know, it might have been over a year, probably a year and a half, two years ago now. This is that yellow slip on the body and that white slip on the rim. And inside it's just brown clay. So uh, that's an example of using slip. Almost all of my pottery is slipped. So this is a Salado Polychrome. It has a white slip. It has a red slip. And then it's just brown clay on the inside. So... Uh, slips, I use slips a lot because my good building clays are kind of drab colors. And if I want to make polychrome pottery, you know, I've got to use slips to make them a little more attractive. Okay, uh, let me try to catch up on the, uh, uh, on the comments now real quick. And uh, give me a like if you haven't already. I appreciate it. Um, where was I? Uh, there is red clay. In, oh, I saw that. No, nothing, no more questions. Okay, so if you have questions, go ahead and drop them in there. I'm going to move on to the um, uh, to the reduced to the reduced iron paint. So um, the other thing I'm going to talk about is reduced iron paint. So uh, a lot of the pottery in the Southwest, especially the black on white stuff, is done through reduced iron paint. This is a great example. The members are probably the finest example of reduced iron paint in the Southwest, and so. Uh, this is literally painted with iron oxide, with red paint, and then fired in a reduction atmosphere to make it turn black. And this is, uh, this belongs to a friend of mine who's a collector. And um, you can see along the rim, uh, especially on the left side of your screen there, uh, the, the rim's a little bit, the, the paint on the rim is a little bit um, reddish, maybe, maybe a, a reddish brown color. Uh, and that's often, you'll often see it oxidizes around the edge, or maybe it creeps in around the edge. Like they're being fired upside down, and if there's a little air leak, you know, you'll get a little red there. Sometimes the whole pot is red, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but uh, the, these, are, these are red paint that are reduced. Uh, let me go to the next slide here. And, uh, and here's another example. Now, this is not Membrous. Uh, this is more like Cibola whiteware. So uh, up, up in um, northeast Arizona and northwest New Mexico, um, around Zuni and, and in that area are these Cibola whitewares. And most of these are reduced iron paint as well. So similar technology to what the members were using in southern New Mexico. And again, uh, red, they're probably using like uh, hematite, red iron oxide kind of material, painting it on. In fact, um, then they reduce it. They fire it in such a way. So the, I, some of you might have seen the video I did last year where I fired this, um, uh, this ladle. And this was painted with red in the video, if you look. Uh, this was painted with red paint, and then I reduced it. It didn't reduce as well as I'd liked. It's a little bit, a little bit brown, a little bit purple, kind of like the rim of that members bowl I showed you. It, it it oxidized a little bit. When I first opened it up, it was black, but I took it out too soon. It was still really hot, and it kind of turned. It kind of started to turn before my eyes. Uh, and then this one is one I did recently in a video that you might have seen as well. This whole rim was all painted with uh, red iron oxide paint. Uh, and then it was reduced. So you can see it turned black. So, um, it's just a matter of keeping the oxygen out, not in the early stages, because as long as you've got a good roaring fire, that iron will reduce. And then you, what you want to do is at the end, as it's cooling, you need to smother it somehow. And you need to smother it in such a way that it doesn't come into contact with anything organic. Uh, so that's, that's really the key, right? If you have a bowl, you can probably set it upside down and kind of seal around the edges. That's easy. But for a jar, you've got to have some kind of cover shirt or a sagger or something over it and then seal around that to keep the oxygen out. Uh, because if you just pour dirt on it, the dirt's full of little roots and leaves and stuff, and every place something organic touches that pot, it's going to leave a black spot. So you don't want that. Uh, and then let's see. So here's, here's the same pot. This is the pot before I fired it. So this is that. You see how black it is now all the way around. And this is the colors when I, before I painted it. So the around the rim here, that's uh, hematite and clay mixed together. So uh, you can't just paint the minerals directly on the pot. You have to have a fixative, right? 
So a fixative is something that makes it harden in the fire so that it becomes permanent when it's fired. Um, so you have a, you might have a, um, a binder. A binder just makes it stick before it's fired. Binder makes it stick to the brush and such. So in this case, I'm using a Rocky Mountain Bee Plant. You can see it there on the screen uh, to the left of the jar. A little bit of Rocky Mountain Bee Plant as a binder, but then about a third clay as a fixative. So it hardens in the fire. Otherwise, you pull it out of the fire and that paint will wipe off, which is what happened here. It had no fixative because I wanted to see if I could get that iron to stick without a fixative, and it didn't. Um, so uh, that's, the, that's the secret there is that you have to have a fixative. And, uh, and this is another jar from our bowl from another experiment and another video that you may have seen. And I used that red, um, this is just ground up hematite. This is that little jar there that you see in the picture. And, uh, and I used that uh, straight and with some in different, I used a different, different recipes on each section. That's what it was a test of. So I painted them with different, different kinds of hematite, some with a binder, some without, you know what I mean? Uh, and I was trying to reduce it. And it reduced, it, I don't have that one with me. It, it's in the, the office. It reduced a little too, but it's also a little on the purpley side, kind of like that ladle. So I could have I just um, done better on the reduction, but I'm still learning that. I'm still practicing it. So hopefully uh, this kiln conference that's coming up this fall is in Silver City, which is where Membrous Pottery comes from. And we're going to a museum there, uh, the museum, uh, Western New Mexico University Museum, where they have a huge collection of Membrous Pottery. And that was all reduced iron. So I really want to try to get, bring my A game to the Kiln Conference and do some really nice reduced iron painting there and maybe uh, help teach others how to do that. So I'm trying to get up on it, you know, by then. Okay, we'll talk about red paint. Let me see if there's any more questions here real quick. Um, can you try, just one asbesto says, can you try paint on a pot that's already fired and refire it? Um, I have heard of that. Um, I've never tried it, so I can't really tell you from experience, um, but I, I know some people have, have claimed to be able to do that. Now, I've refired pots, so if a pot comes out, you know, not the way I want, I'll refire it, but I've never tried putting paint on it and refiring it. But I, I believe it's possible. I just don't know, you know, what the trick would be if there is one. So um, give it a try, you know. Okay, so let's talk about red paint really quick. So this is a membrous pot that was fired in an oxidizing atmosphere, so it wasn't reduced. Now, there's a lot of uh, speculation among members pot aficionados of about whether or not this was done on purpose or an accident. Some say, oh, this is just a misfire, right? Like they meant to they meant to reduce it and something went wrong. I mean, anybody that's fired outdoors knows that things go wrong a lot. It's possible. But at the same time, um, it could be they were purposely trying to oxidize it. You know, it's hard for us, you know, a thousand years later to know what their intentions were. It is a little reduced up around the rim, so it's possible they were trying. And, and failed, I don't know, but, um, but, but, but this kind of red, okay, this kind of red, uh, and this kind of red, which is Holcom red, they might look very different, but they're essentially the same technology. In fact, Membrous black on white evolved out of red on brown. So we'll go back, go back in Membrous uh, to the time when they first started making decorated pottery. They were making red on brown pottery. Uh, so this is, this, is a, a, this is a bowl I fired yesterday. This is Dragoon Red on Brown. This is a Mogion Red on Brown type. And, and the members are a type of Mogion, a, a branch of the Mogion. So they were making Red on Brown pottery, very similar to this. And then they discovered a white slip. And then they would slip it white and they would paint red on it. And they made red on white. And they were going along with their red on white. And then they found that they could reduce it. And so suddenly these red on whites become uh, black on whites as they learn to reduce. And so it seems like there's a very logical progression as they learn to make black on white pottery. And so I think it's logical uh, to conclude that, you know, they're, the, the whole com were just to the west of the Mogollon, you know, were, they all learned pottery, you know, together. They were sharing technology and that red paint, you know, was probably shared as a recipe across the area. And it's all pretty much the same. So like I said about the red paint, you've got your, um, You've got your hematite, whatever that source is. I've got a, a little, I've got a little palette here, and these are 
These are actual hematite stones that I've collected uh, from different mines and stuff. And you can just and you can just scrub them on your palate, and and that stuff will just powder. It'll just powder up, uh, you know. And and you just add a little water. Boom! It's like a nice red paint just just by rubbing that that hematite stone on that slab. But uh, it it's gonna go on the pot nice if you add water. It'll paint fine. Uh, but as soon as that as soon as that paint dries and the pot's dry before it's fired, right? Then you can just come along, and um, I didn't bring any red on brown just to show you. You can just wipe it off because there's nothing holding it on. Uh, so, got a helicopter going overhead, sorry. Um, so that's where your binder comes in. So you need a binder to hold that mineral on the pot. So I use mesquite sap. These are little crystalline chunks of mesquite sap. And I just crush a little bit up in my paint. And that makes it harden on the pot before firing so that it doesn't wipe off. So a lot of times as you're painting, right, you're handling the pot. You're holding it in your hand while you're painting the designs on it. But you don't want this hand over here to be smudging your designs, you know, before you even get them to the fire. So you need a binder, all right? So uh, if you don't have sap nodules, this is my mesquite bean um, gook, you know, syrup that I cook down that I use for organic paint. But anything like this, any plant cooked down to a, to a thick syrup can be used as an organic binder for mineral paint as well. So you've got your binder, but then you need a fixative, right? You need something that's going to make it harden in the fire. Because in the fire, this organic stuff, this binder is going to burn away. And you're going to be right back where you were before with just a powder on top of your pot. Now, clay is magical. Clay has the ability to turn hard in a fire. All minerals don't do that, right? If I grind up... Uh, hematite into a powder and I can you know get it wet but still after the firing it doesn't turn into a solid it's just still powder so that's where a little bit of clay is added to it about a 20 to 30 percent clay added to that powder will cause it to harden in the fire and that's the key to the um, to the the, the red paint uh, or any of these mineral paints is you have to have a binder and a fixative so here's here's uh this is down in um uh, Maori. So Maori is some some old mines that are south of here um, on Forest Service land. So you can go up there and wander around and collect rocks because it's legal on Forest Service land to do uh, what they call rock hounding, collecting small amounts of, of stones for personal use. And you can just scratch them on the rock and you can see what color they make. So, you know, there's a variety of, of different shades. There's some that are darker red, there's some that are brighter, some that are a little more pastel. Uh, and find the ones you want. Find the ones that are soft because you don't want the hard ones are harder to make paint out of. Obviously, the ones that are soft make paint very easily. So, um, uh, you know, and just get that and then mix it with a little clay for a fixative. Boom, you're off to the races. Uh, and here's uh, here's me painting uh, on a pot. Those spirals are fun, um, and that again is uh, hematite mixed with some red clay. And uh, and here's a place where I'm digging um, uh, what they call red ochre. So it, it comes out of the ground instead of coming out like a rock, like this hematite here, which came from Maori. Uh, this comes out in a powdery form, and so it, it's easy to use. Uh, so you know you got to get out there and and do some hiking around. And that mine, mindat.org, I think, is a great website for finding minerals uh, like hematite or copper carbonate or manganese or any of those minerals that you might be looking for uh, to use for pottery paint. So check that out. And that's worldwide. That's not just the United States. That's all over the world. So uh, that's a good resource. Uh, let me go back now and make sure I haven't missed any questions. Um, David Pritcher. Uh, did first peoples use other metal powders to make other colors, i.e. copper for blue or green, copper oxides to green, but most copper glaze are green. Um, so David, um, unfortunately, and I'll, and I'll get to that in the, um, in the, the mineral blacks, uh, copper doesn't make uh, blue or green paint. It looks really nice when it's painted on the pot, um, but as soon as you fire it, that copper turns to dark gray or black color. Uh, so you copper I do use copper um, I've got a little container of copper carbonate right here um, you know it just doesn't make blue or green paint so blue and green are not it's not possible to achieve those colors through uh, primitive means uh, you know it may be in a in a electric kiln and those kind of things with commercial glazes but uh, you you cannot you cannot get blue and green so you can get yellows uh, oranges, reds, uh, you can get whites, blacks, grays, uh, browns. Um, you can even get some that are kind of purple. 
Um, not not true purple, but but a little you know, a little. What's that kind of reddish purple, right? I, I can't think of it right now, but you know you can kind of get on the reddish end of purple. There's some clay. Uh, there's some paint, some prehistoric pottery here in far southern Arizona near the Mexican border that they call trincheras purple on red, uh, but it's not a true purple. It's more gray. Um, so everything from about you know in the spectrum from red uh, through yellows, oranges, uh, browns. Those are easy. Blacks and whites, easy. Um, blues and greens. A yellow you can get. Blues and greens you cannot. So, um, How did they seal the pots for long-term storage? Um, a pot, I have a couple of videos, Zane, about sealing pottery. Uh, you, can boil, just, you can just boil um, um, some kind of starch in it. So a lot of the natives would boil cornmeal because that was a starch that they had a lot of. They grew a lot of corn. I put my mug away. Oh, so this is the mug. This is a mug I made in a recent video, and I, uh, I just boiled um, uh, oatmeal in it. And I just put it on my stove top. I set it right on the burner, put the oatmeal in it and some water, and let it boil for, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. And it sealed good. So starch is a great sealer. Oils are another good sealer. Um, you know, and then there's commercial sealants and stuff, too, that you can get. Adam says, my son Asher is wanting to know if you can do organic paints that aren't made with a slip. Uh, you'll have... To if you've done a video that covers this, do you remember? No, um, no, I haven't done organic paint that's not on slip because I don't have any good building clays that hold organic paint. But there is such a thing. Uh, and John Olson, uh, he, he, has, uh, he has some of those paints, and he has a lot of pottery that he's made where there is no slip. It's just the organic paint is painted right on the body clay. But remember, to get organic paints to work, you have to have just the right clay that's going to hold that organic, lock it away, and allow it to make black designs. So most clays will not do that. Um, so you have to do a little experimenting and find what clays work that way. I don't have any. It's very hard for me to find any that will hold organic paint here. And so the ones that I do have, I'm using as a slip. But su such clays do exist. Um, I just don't have access to them. Um, uh, Zane, uh, I own a store on Main Street. Oh, he's just talking to somebody else. Uh, Ren Pixie, I have some copal resin. Would any plant resin work as a binder? I don't know anything about copal resin, but uh, yeah, I think any plant binder is going to work. Any kind of resin is going to work as a binder. Remember, the binder is just holding it in place until the firing. During the firing, that, that organic binder burns away, so you have to have that fixative as well, some clay that's going to make it harden. But yeah, I think just about any plant, because, you know, like when I'm making organic paint, I mean, almost any of this stuff will work as a binder for organic paint, so, or for mineral paint, so I think, I think that should work. Um, Nom, do you have a process, to process the red ochres before painting with them? No, um, you can, if, if you've got little chunks of larger material, then you might want to run it through a screen or levigate it, um, but a lot of those ochres are super fine right out of the you know, right off the bat, and you can just use them. Or, you know, if you have a few little, like, soft, but they're chunks, you know what I mean, like lumps of oatmeal, you know what I mean? Some of the times there's a little chunk, but you don't want it on your, paint it on your pot, but at the same time, it's not really, like, hard rock. You can just put it on a little pallet and get a little stone and just kind of grind it like that and, and soften that up pretty fast. Ochre is almost, you know, used just the way it is. I usually levigate mine just to make sure I don't have any chunks, and then I can just spoon it out of a container and not worry about getting lumps in it. So I just levigate it first just to process it. But you don't have to. Uh, blue and green are the holy grail colors, the primitive pottery circles. Absolutely. Uh, reddish purple mauve. Yeah, that's right, Ren Pixie. Something like mauve. Yeah, You can get kind of leaning a little purpley is where it goes. When I say sealing, I'm talking about filling the pots with things like water. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So you can make the pots semi-waterproof. I mean, I don't think you're... With natural materials, I don't think you're ever going to get 100%. But you can do like 90%, you know, uh, and that's done with uh, boiling starches in it mostly. But you can use oil as well. And there's other things. I mean, you could seal it with pine pitch, which I know you're familiar with because uh, you're a basket maker. Um, but uh, I, think, I think that's not so much for... Um, cook pottery. You know, you wouldn't want to cook in something that was sealed with pine pitch because it would taste terrible. Um, but it'd be great for just a water jar, right? Uh, how to get black semi-mirror finish. Oh, hey, I, I got you covered there. Uh, Na Manish Nakrani. I'm probably butchering your name, so I apologize. Wants to know how I get a, a black semi-mirror finish. Look at this. Look at this. Can you see that? 
See, you see the shine on that? Here, let me go back to the. Uh, I'm still getting the, the sub. You can go ahead and uh, and give me a thumbs up if you want, and subscribe as well. But look at the look at the finish on that, huh? Isn't that nice? That's my glaze. That's glaze. Uh, so let me. If I get back to my my presentation, um, we're gonna we'll talk about glaze. Let's talk about glaze real fast. So uh, let's talk about prehistoric glaze paint. This is four mile polychrome. So a lot of those white mountain redwares, the later white mountain redwares, so not early stuff like Wingate or four mile, those are early. Uh, but the later stuff like Pinedale polychrome, four mile polychrome, Sholo polychrome, um, Cedar Creek polychrome, these have a glaze paint. That doesn't mean they're glazed all over. It's just a paint that is glaze. It's lead, lead based paint that forms a glaze. And so you can see here where it's super glazy in some places and not so much in others. This is a good picture because a lot of the pictures are taken from such an angle that you, it doesn't look glazy unless you look at it up close or in person. Uh, but this picture kind of captures some of that glaziness. Uh, and so let me show you another one here. This is um, uh, from over in the Rio Grande area. This is Rio Grande Glazeware, which they made right up until the 1600s or something. Uh, the, during the Pueblo Revolt, they stopped making it and that technology was lost. But the, the blacks are glaze here. And in some of these, now I don't know about this one, in some of these, they even have a red glaze paint, whereas the white mountain stuff, only the black was, was glazed. Some beautiful stuff. And so a lot of people have tried over the years to, to achieve uh, glaze paint. And it's very, they're like, archeologists can look at the paint on those shirts and they can say, oh, you know, it's 30% copper and 20% lead. And you know, they can break it down. But if you just throw those ingredients together, it doesn't glaze. So there's more to it. There's extra steps in there, okay? So these are some of the ingredients I use to make glaze paint. Um, so I, you've got uh, in the little El Pato can there, the little metal can that looks like it's been burned, uh, that's, my, that's my lead. So let me see, let me show you my lead. I looked everywhere for Galena. Galena is natural lead ore. And I hiked all over the mountains and I never could find any. And so I went to a rock shop and bought this. I paid, as you can see, $7.50. And it wasn't very big um, to try to make lead paint. And then I ground it up. It ground pretty easy. I thought it would be hard to grind because they're little, you know, crystalline pieces. But they grind pretty easy. And it's a little bit glittery powder. And I did just what the archaeologist said, right? Oh, it's 20% this and it's 30% that or whatever. I mixed it all up and it didn't make glaze. And I fired it hotter and it still didn't make glaze. And I tried all kinds of different things and it's very frustrating, right? So uh, how are they making glaze? Um, so uh, what Eric Blindman, he's an archeologist for the state of New Mexico. Uh, he might be retired now. Anyways, he had done some experiments with those Rio Grande glazewares. And what he found was there's evidence at some of the archeolo archeological sites in New Mexico that they were processing their their lead, they were pre-roasting it, all right? So galena is lead sulfide, okay? And the sulfur in there is preventing the lead from melting at a low temperature. Lead has a very low melting point, like 500 degrees Celsius or something like that, ridiculously low. Um, but with the sulfur in it, the galena's melting point is really high, like, you know, 1300 degrees Celsius, ridiculous, something I can't possibly reach. Uh, so what he found was some, some evidence in an archaeological context to show that they were pre-roasting their lead, that they were trying to cook, if they could get it heated up, cook that sulfur out of it, basically turn that galena into lead oxide, which would then melt at a much lower temperature. So I, I put it in the little can, and I put it on a hot fire where I was firing pottery, actually, and I, 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 I cooked it, I got it hot, and I stirred it while it was doing that so that it would... Um, hopefully oxidize all those particles. And then I mixed it with the copper and then the red clay. So that, so it's, uh, it's copper, le lead, copper carbonate, uh, lead clay, or <laughs> lead clay, red clay, which is in the jar there, and then a little bit of an organic binder. This is bee plant. It was given to me by Tori Hoops. Um, mix that together and, um, and uh, I, you know, I, so, so here's, I'm still doing the subscribe thing. Let me turn that off. Uh, so here's my, this is my little example pot. This one was, uh, this one was without an organic binder. This one was with an organic binder. And you can't, maybe if I tilt it the right way, they are a little, they're a little glazy, okay? 
but these didn't get as hot, okay? This one was fired in my little brick kiln. It got really hot. And, and that's the same recipe, by the way. And man, is that stuff glazy. I mean, it's just, like you said, almost like a metallic black. Just really good. So uh, I think I'm on to something, okay? Uh, lead, copper, it's got, as, it's got as much copper as it's got lead. It's got a lot of copper. There's no manganese in it, which is pretty tip. Manganese is kind of your go-to for black mineral paint. No manganese. And then some red clay as a, a fixative. I don't know if the red clay is necessary. I haven't fiddled with it enough to know. I don't know if even the organic binder is necessary, but it does keep it from smudging off. So. That's where I'm at on the lead, um, making some progress on it. So uh, it's interesting. I'm still learning. Uh, and, you know, it's one of those things you, you probably study on your whole life and not get to the bottom of some of these things. Um, so let's talk about oxidized black really fast. So here's an example of oxidized black mineral paint. This is Casas Grandes stuff from down in northern Chihuahua. Uh, we get this a lot out at the, the ruin that I own by the Chiricahuas because it's fairly close to the Mexican border. This stuff was coming up in trade. Um, and then another example here, uh, this is uh, Cayenta polychrome from or Tucson from up in northern Arizona. And you can see that the red designs are outlined with a black mineral paint. Uh, and so uh, or oxidized, obviously oxidized because the red's red, the orange is orange. If it was reduced, it'd, it'd be a much paler colors. Um, so obviously they were getting oxidized black back in the day. And the secret to good oxidized black is manganese. Here's, this is the same rock that's in the picture here. Um, and then here it is in the little container. It's just, it's ground up. I, so I, I ground it in my corn grinder. I levigated it to get all the chunks out of it. And now I can just, when I'm mixing it up, I can just take a little spoon and just measure it out, which is pretty handy. Um, so, um, in a good oxidizing fire, manganese will turn black, real black, real good black. Um, and so you have to have, just like I talked about before, you have to, you want to use an organic binder to keep it from smudging while you're painting it. You want to use about 30% clay to keep it, you know, as a, as a fixative to make it harden in the fire. And you can add copper to that. Uh, my general, um, recipe is, is, uh, copper manganese, about equal parts copper, manganese, a little red clay, and, um, and some organic binder. Um, you don't have to. Now, I'll talk to you about um, browns, okay? I'll talk to you about reduction and uh, oxidation. No, oh, hold on. I changed my scenes. Okay, so here, here is, this one's a little dusty because it's been sitting on my shelf for a while, but you can look at the black there and see. That's a pretty good black, right? That's pretty decent black. That is oxidized. The reason we know it's oxidized is that that yellow slip that I used turned on cherry red. So nice and oxidized. If you get it a real good oxidizing fire, uh, you will get a good black. If you reduce it, no, not even reduced. If it's just not oxidized enough, if there's not enough abundance of oxidant, oxygen through the process. Like if you fire in a pit, if you're firing below ground level, it's really hard to get a good oxidation on it. Okay, so... Here's a pot I made for the kiln conference last year. It's a canteen. It's got a little tube inside. So these holes, see the hole? It goes all the way through, and they would pass a strap through it, and then they could carry it. And the little tube makes it so water doesn't leak out the holes. Pretty clever. This is from a, a piece that's in a museum. Um, and this was painted, uh, the slip with a nice white slip, and it was painted with a manganese-based black paint. And I really wanted to put something in the trench kiln fire. So I put this in knowing that the manganese paint doesn't do well in a, sm a smothered firing like that. So here's what I got. Look at It's very brownish, isn't it? See how brownish that is? This is exactly the same paint recipe. Okay. Uh, do I have another one here somewhere? Yeah, here. This is one I fired yesterday. Okay. The same paint recipe. Okay, the difference is this was fired in a, on the surface in a super oxidized environment. This was fired in a trench kiln, not so much oxygen. This is what happens. And, and it, this, you can do this on the surface too. When I first started, I was getting browns on my manganese all the time. It frustrated me. And I thought there was something wrong with my manganese. But it's a matter of leaving lots of airspace around your pots so you're getting plenty of oxygen through the whole process, not stacking that wood too tight, keeping that oxygen flowing, and you'll get a good black. That is really key. Now, the other thing that you get 
Remember, I said my recipe includes a little bit of uh, copper. So you see, you see in here how it's a little bit, you know, a little bit of a reddish or purplish area in here. So if you reduce, if you reduce, that's different than not a fully oxidizing fire. A little bit reduced, where you're actually sucking oxygen away, right? Uh, if you reduce that copper, it'll get like a red halo around it. Look at this. This is the same. This is that same paint recipe again. So on this, it was sitting in a it was setting like this in a firing. It was propped up on rocks, but it, was, it wasn't getting good air down here, right? Because it was, there were logs around it. And so the top oxidized really well. See, it oxidized nice. It's still reduced in places, but the bottom reduced like crazy. And, and that copper did that red thing, which it does if it reduces. So this is what happens if you reduce copper. Um, and that's why copper is only really good in oxidizing fire. And, and manganese also is really only good in an oxidizing fire. If you're going to reduce uh, and you want black, you're better to go with um, uh, a, red, a red iron oxide reduction black. Okay, I hope I covered that good for you because that uh, that's real important to know that your manganese and copper both make good blacks in oxidation, but they make terrible blacks in reduction or even if it's not fully oxidized. So if you're gonna reduce, go all in on reduction and use an iron-based black. If you're gonna oxidize, go ahead with the copper manganese. You know, that's really nice, but you have to oxidize really well, okay? Let me go back and look at the questions. Um, I don't think I asked the right question. What did the potters use for lids on their pots to keep animals and insects? Oh, uh, so here in the Southwest, at least, they didn't make lids for their pots, uh, not as a general rule. So when we find caches, like up in caves, uh, there was a cotton cache found in, near Safford here in Southern Arizona. And there was these big, big jars full, stuffed full of cotton and they just had bowls set over the, the mouth. So a bowl sat over the top. In some cases, uh, I was looking at reports for a site no, it was, um, who's the guy that wrote the book about interpreting the designs on prehistoric pottery? Um, Kunkel, James Kunkel, he has a YouTube channel here. And uh, if you go, he has a lot of prehistoric pottery that he got from a ruin he excavated. And he talked about some of these jars that had these little openings like this. They were finding wads of, like mushroom-shaped wads of clay in the excavation, unfired clay and mushroom-shaped wads, and they couldn't figure out what those wads of clay were. Turned out, finally he saw one that had the imprint of a rim on it. They were basically jar, not not this little. This is a test jar, right? So like, if you had a big jar with a small opening like this, then you would take a wad of unfired clay and just you know stick it on there, and that would keep all the bugs out. And then when you're done, you just pop it off and throw it away because it's just a wad of unfired clay. So he said that's what they were using uh, up there, and that was up in northern Arizona. So, uh, but they didn't make lids per se down here uh, prehistorically. Okay, where am I at here? Um, a kiln is that? I just made a kiln using bricks and mud. I got a little fire going to dry it. <laughs> hey, Deck, you're going to love my, uh, my video in a couple weeks about my kiln firing. So look for that. David Pritchett. Hey, Zane, I've seen where some cultures would use either beeswax. Uh, well, certainly not here in the Southwest because um, we didn't have honeybees before the Europeans came. So uh, no beeswax. Nice seeing those pots, their history and making. Zane, Dave. Uh, just one asbestos. I actually like, really like that reduced copper. Yeah, well, it's a cool color. That's why I said, I mean, I could, it, it, it's really cool. It, it's not really authentic for like anything prehistoric, but it's, it's beautiful. I think it's a neat effect too. Uh, Zane, if my brain, in my brain, I fill the jar with a product like corn or water and I seal the jar with something so I can store it. Yeah, a big old hunk of wet clay. Uh, Glass Gavian, have you ever tried just copper, no manganese or oxidizing fire? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, hold on a second. Where's my, I have a test thing here. Uh, oh, here it is, here it is, here it is. So I made this to bring to uh, demonstrations some years back. And this is painted with different, uh -oh, different materials, okay, uh, that are painted on and then fired so that you can see how they change. And I have a little nugget of the raw material and I'll set this on the table and then I'll put that little chunk of the raw material above it so kids can come by and see how these minerals change as they're fired. So this is manganese, pure manganese and with a little clay. This is uh, hematite, iron oxide, right? This is white clay. 
This is uh, yellow ochre. This is um, um, like this kind of material. Your bright yellow. Okay. Where am I at? Boop, 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 boop. This is copper. So you can see it's uh, it's it's reasonable, uh, but but the manganese is blacker, right? The the copper is a little on the gray side, and that's that's been my experience with pure copper, which is why if you mix it with the manganese, you usually get pretty good uh, outcome. Pritchard, I understand a ring of melted beeswax or clay was applied around the rim to seal the lid on the pot. Uh, no, they didn't have beeswax. Um, that, that, that bowl would literally, okay, it would literally just sit on there with gravity. Uh, and, you know, maybe there's a little bit of space, but for the most part, you know, it's sealed. And that, I, from what I understand, uh, at least from what I've read, that's how they did it uh, in the prehistoric Southwest. But, I mean, maybe there was some, I mean, every, every culture is different. Every village is different. There, there are certainly exceptions to every rule, too. That's helping me out so much with my manganese black problem. More oxygen. Yeah, Stephen, I've, I've totally had the same problem. In fact, I've had that problem for years. I, I do know where it's coming from. That's a very good range of colors. Uh, okay, so uh, we got about nine minutes. Let me uh, quickly go back over these points that I wanted to remind you of uh, because we have different people here that were here earlier. Uh, the Southwest Kiln Conference is coming up the end of, or the first week of October, 7th to the 10th, something like that. It's a great opportunity to learn. I'm going to be there if you want to come meet me or some other potters. Uh, it's free, okay? There's, there's no fee. There's a fee for like a, a catered dinner if you want to do that and if you want a t-shirt. Other than that, there's no cost. You just have to get yourself to Silver City, New Mexico in October. So um, swkiln.com, Okay. Uh, I have a Slack community that I'm building for channel members. So if you want to be able to ask me questions anytime, get good responses, get some inside information, and talk with other really committed primitive pottery students, uh, join my channel membership by clicking that join button down below, and I'll send you an invite uh, to the Slack, and, and uh, we can communicate more closely, a little more privately, okay? Uh, uh, John Olson, uh, a very fine potter who's been doing replication since the 70s and has taught many, many of us. He's, he's a great teacher who doesn't keep secrets. He teaches everything. He, he gives freely of his information. He's suffering from cancer, and he's doing treatments right now. And so we're raising money for his medical treatments. There's a GoFundMe. The link is down in the doobly-doo. The link down there for the Southwest Kiln Conference as well. Okay. So uh, let me get back to my presentation in the last few minutes and try to cover uh, organic paint. <coughs> okay, hold on. I think the only one I have left to cover is organic paint. So uh, examples of organic paint prehistorically. So uh, a lot of people, when they think organic paint, they think that Anazazi black on white, which is a prime example, but a lot of, like I talked about earlier, a lot of organic Anazazi black on white pottery was mineral paint. All that Cibola whiteware down around Chaco and Zuni, that was all mineral paint that was reduced. But up in the Four Corners area, up around Mesa Verde, that is the center of that organic painted. And, you know, and also over uh, towards, towards Hopi, along the northern part of Arizona, uh, a lot of this organic painted black on white. So these mugs, these Mesa Verde mugs are a prime example of Anazazi organic painted black on white. But another good example is Salado Polychrome from down here in my country. Now, this is a technology that started up there, moved south, um, and so the paint on this big bowl here, all that black is organic paint. Uh, and notice that it's only applied on the white section because that white is that magical special clay that will hold organic paint and turn it into black designs. Uh, so the secret, uh, the paint is, you know, the paint's okay, paint, uh, paint's important, uh, but it's not so much the organic paint as the, as the slip and the firing method. So uh, I have a video coming out uh, in two weeks, uh, I think July 20th, something like that, ab about how to make organic paint out of mesquite beans. Um, but you can use the same method to make organic paint out of Rocky Mountain bee plants, sunflower, tansy mustard, all kinds of things. Uh, it's basically just boiling it down. Put it in a big pot, boil the heck out of it then strain all the solids out and boil that liquid down until it's a thick, you know, syrup, almost like a tar, and then pour it into containers and let it dry. 
I'm selling it on my website now, but I'm, I'm quickly selling out. There's, I made a big batch and, and I've, I sold a ton of it. So there's some left on there if you're interested, uh, but you're certainly um, welcome to make your own. Um, so I'm either gonna have to make some more or just be out pretty soon on this. Uh, what was I gonna say about it? Um, it? It takes a lot of material to cook down to a very little amount of paint. The mesquite bean smells really good and it's sweet. Uh, the Rocky Mountain bee plant is nasty stuff. You wouldn't wanna eat that. <laughs> so uh, let's see so I cook it down here it is after I've taken all the solids out strained them out it's just like a thick tea at this point and then I continue to boil it on my stovetop until it's gooey really thick and then I pour it into containers oh here's what I was gonna say if you get some of this from me or if you, if you make some remember to keep it open right um, if you put a lid on this this obviously this is just a little pot that I made but if you put it in like a like a lidded jar like here's how I keep my slip right in a little lidded container um, if you put the the bee plant or the mesquite bean whatever your organic paint in there and you put the lid on it it could ferment and get really nasty so always make sure you leave the lid off or leave the lid maybe just that's not sealed so it doesn't ferment and spoil okay um, And here's, uh, here I'm pouring, that's mesquite bean, you can tell by the orange color, uh, pouring it into little containers. These were ones I made a couple years back that I took to the uh, Southwest Kiln Conference to sell. Uh, so um, and this is similar to, I have little jars with screw-on lids because these just pop on. These are like the ones you get ketchup from at a restaurant sometimes, right? And they don't seal good. And so I can't stick these in the mail and mail them or, you know, it'll end up running all over the the post office, right? <laughs> so I've got little jars that have lids on them. I can screw that lid on tight and pop it in an envelope and mail it now. Um, so let's see, let's talk a little bit about applying it. So I don't have any here, and I don't have any here now that, that aren't unfired, but basically like in the picture here, you just, you rehydrate it. Like right now it's kind of plasticky, right? I can turn this upside down, it's not falling out. But add a little water, mix it up with a brush. It rehydrates really fast. And then just paint it on your pot, right? And just sticky syrup. And then, um, so here's my material here on the upper left that's kind of been rehydrated a little bit. And here I'm painting it. This is yucca fruit, you can tell by the golden color. Um, paint it on the pot and then fire it. And if you fire it in a brief oxidizing fire, so it has to be oxidizing, but it can't be too long. Because if it's too long or too hot, you start burning that organic paint away. Uh, then it comes out a nice black like this. So um, with Salado Polychrome, you need that red. If the, with the, with the uh, Anazazi stuff, the trench kiln fired stuff, um, that's smothered. So they don't want it to oxidize. They oxidize enough to, to burn the, the dark color off of the pot. You know, like sometimes you'll get, um, your pot will be kind of gray at first. You have to get it hot enough to burn it out till it starts turning white. Uh, and then they smother it to keep the oxygen out and then they get those nice um, really bright white whites and, and black blacks that's how they do that and if you come to the kiln conference I have a video that I did at the kiln conference last year if you're interested in those trench kilns um, that's not a kind of pottery I make but I did a video on how they do it and uh, you can check that out but if you come to the kiln conference you can learn from the masters who are doing that and uh, and learn how they how they make, how they do those, um, those trench kilns, which are awesome. Um, so uh, I've only got a couple minutes. Um, I don't know if I covered this one. This is one I fired yesterday. That came out pretty good. That's just a, that's just a brown body clay uh, with red ochre. Uh, red ochre and water painted on. There's no fixative in this. So my fixative is um, that I, I burnished it all in. So if you see it, you can see that it kind of, you can see the, the stone strokes on it. So basically while it was still damp, I, I burnished all of the material in and that set those particles, those red hematite particles into the still damp clay so they became permanent. So that's another way of kind of fixing that material on your pot. Uh, do we have questions? Mm, let's see, what do we got for questions? Dave yeah, Pritchard, I apologize. I know that apiculture was not historically done in the Americas. Uh, yeah, Middle East or Mediterranean, for sure, for sure. In the Americas, it wasn't just that apiculture, or, you know, they weren't, it's not that they weren't keeping bees. Uh, they didn't even have honeybees, so uh, they couldn't even have collected uh, beeswax from the wild. 
Uh, Booba should have been more explicit. Uh, please turn the sound up a little bit. Oh, well, he waited till the last second. I'd have done it earlier. Uh, how's that? Is that better? Um, yeah, I wish you'd have said something earlier. I'm almost done with the, um, with the live stream now. Um, Mark Ovochka. I, I apologize if the sound was low. Um, I did not know that. If you, if you ever hear me and, and it, you know, catch one of these and the, and the sound is low, just holler at me. Yucca tastes good with sriracha sauce. Uh, yeah, no, oh, I don't think so. Thank you so much. It's been fascinating. Okay, uh, so, you know, it's 11 o'clock. So if you guys don't have questions, can you burnish in them? Yeah, absolutely. You can burnish in that manganese as well. Any kind of a, um, in a mineral can be, can be powered into the pot. Um, I did that on a pot. What did I do? I did that on a, on a pot here. Oh, my little um, uh, oil lamp that I made in that oil lamp video. I, I did that. So I talk about it a little bit there. If you guys don't have any questions, uh, we'll wrap it up. All right, don't forget, Southwest Kiln Conference, uh, Slack for channel members, uh, John Olson's GoFundMe. The link to that is down in the doobly-doo. Thanks for watching, everybody. Have a good one.